You'll ever be, huh? As I'll ever be, yeah. <laughs> Today is April 18th, 2011. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And I'm here with Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored to have with us today Dan Bennett, a Vietnam veteran who served two tours in Vietnam, who has kindly agreed to come in here and tell us his story in connection with the uh, Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, number one, I want to say happy birthday, Dan. Oh, thank you. And uh, we really, are, really appreciate you coming in today to, to share your experiences with us. Could you give us your full name and your current address, please? Well, my given name was Daniel Lawrence Bennett. Um, mother called me Danny. Okay. I live in Cumming, Georgia right now. Okay. And your date of birth and where you were born, could you tell us? April 18th, 1946, here in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And I was raised in a little small town called Duluth, Georgia. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, raised in a small home, small town. We had 47 seniors in my high school class. We we're still pretty close. Um, but we have a reunion here next month. Oh. Um, it was a small southern town. It was mostly uh, segregated as mm -hmm. it was in those days. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing about that was I was never really um, prejudiced until I, well, not really at all in my life. Because the blacks were there and the whites were here. We didn't mingle until mm -hmm. years later. Yeah. You can cut that part out. That doesn't sound good. Well, no, that's, I think that's a very common, common experience for, for me, for all of us. Well, I was raised Southern Baptist. And, uh -huh. uh, mother kept me in church all the time. Okay. Uh, Sunday, Monday, and Wednesdays, and twice on Sundays. Okay. Did you have relatives who had served in the military? My father did, and he had four brothers who all served in the military in World War II. Okay. And my dad was a radio operator on B-17s and B-24s in England, 8th Air Force. Okay. And his older brother was killed in Normandy, Hoyt oh. Bennett. Oh. Um, he wasn't the day, he was somewhere past Normandy. Okay. He went in like on day June the 12th, yeah. is when he landed on the beach, okay. after the main invasion. Okay. Um, Uncle Roland was in uh, Aleutian Islands, uh, fighting the Japanese on one of the islands up there. Hmm. Uh, Uncle Oscar was in World War II, he was in the Pacific. He was in Tarawa and Tinian. Wow. Um, and the only one who was killed was Uncle Hoyt. Gee. When did you enter the military? 1967. February. I was uh, finished high school 65, and my dad worked at Lockheed as an engineer. And he worked a deal to get me co-op to go to Georgia Tech. Well, my grades barely got me in, and so I was down there my first year. And I was so overwhelmed with the uh, work, and it took a lot of discipline that I didn't have at the time. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out, and immediately I tried to hide it from my dad because he'd be upset. But in that time, I, I wanted to do something, <clears throat> I didn't know what. I had a pilot's license already, my dad flew an airplane, he was a part owner of a small airplane. <laughs> and so I've been flying since I was 14. So I knew I wanted to fly something. So I thought, Air Force. Mm -hmm. Well, the Air Force, you have to have a college degree to fly. So my next best choice was to be in maintenance. That's what I went into, aircraft maintenance. Okay. How did your family and your friends feel about you joining up? Um, my dad was really upset and mom was hysterical. She didn't want any part of it because uh, Vietnam War was on mm -hmm. TV every night mm -hmm. and people dying and mm -hmm. being maimed and killed so they didn't want any part of it. And my dad was really upset because he, he worked hard to get me in school and keep me there yeah. and I laid him down yeah. and he let me know that right away. Yeah. Often. Yeah. So, uh, they weren't too pleased about it. Okay. What was the extent of your knowledge of, of Vietnam at the time? What was going on there? And what? Like most kids, I, I see it on TV. I thought that's so far away. It's so unattached to what I'm doing and what I'm involved with. Most teenagers are self-absorbed with their own little environment, and that's mm -hmm. where I was too. <laughs> yeah. um, I knew you know, there was a war going on somewhere, but I thought I would never be there. Yeah. Never even give a second thought. Okay. And when I joined, I didn't think about going there either. Yeah. It just happened to evolve. Okay. Talk about 
your training when you did go into the Air Force, where you went, what you were being trained to do, any experiences that you'd like to share? Well, I went to Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, San Antonio. Uh, it was like a big Boy Scout camp, actually. I went there expecting all kinds of horrible stories, but it wasn't that bad at all. Keeping those clean, things went well. The guys who acted up or didn't want to be there, they had trouble. From there, they gave us a battery of tests to see how intelligent we were, and uh, they categorized us in different places. You get a choice of what you want to do, and I selected aircraft maintenance. And after 12 weeks of basic training, they sent me to Illinois, which was uh, uh, Chinook Air Force Base, ran to, <coughs> and they taught me how to be an aircraft mechanic. So uh, that was uh, four or five months long. I can't remember how long it was. My first assignment from there was Charleston, South Carolina. And they put me on this huge airplane called the C-124, big old four-engine propeller airplane. That, it was called the 438th MAT, military, transport, a military aircraft transport organization. And the thing was as big as all get out to me. I could see how the thing would fly. But that was my first assignment. Now what year was that? 1967. Okay. You know, I was there in July of 67, so okay. I got there. Okay. And I uh, met my wife there in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and we married. Okay. But before that was over with, in November, I got orders to go to Vietnam. So, uh, of 67. And that really upset me. <laughs> <laughs> Why now? I just got married. Yeah. <laughs> but they did. So uh, they sent me to uh, a school in Louisiana. And it, England Air Force Base in Alexandria, Louisiana. I was there a few weeks uh, to learn the maintenance of a C-123 aircraft, another cargo aircraft, two engine. Okay. So I was there and they sent me to a real brief jungle survival training school. I thought, what's the point of this? I later on found out why. Hmm. But uh, when I got to Vietnam, I flew to Cameron Bay and they have a big holding center there like, like most military places do. And they divide you up. They must draw lots, because they've got something to Denang. And I thought, well, okay, I didn't know Denang from Saigon or anything else. Uh, when I got there, they put me in a uh, special operations group. The fourth special operations group is a SOG op outfit. And um, it was C-47 gunships, AC-47s. I thought, okay, this is a lot smaller than what I'm used to working on. It'd be a lot easier. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> Because part of my job was maintaining the airplane, keeping it running, patching bullet holes, loading ammo, loading flares, was to fly along with them, kicking flares out the, out the chutes in the back. Uh, when I got there, I had an old guy, an old staff sergeant was, uh, was my crew chief. He taught me the ropes. He said, never sit in the rear of the airplane when you fly. I always sit up front, midway up front. I said, why is that? He said, the goods can't shoot very straight, and any bullets will hit the tail. And that later on proved very true because we got hit several times. And had I been sitting in the back where I usually sat, I wouldn't have been here today because we had several holes come through there. Yeah. Huh. They didn't lead the aircraft properly, I guess. Yeah. We operated uh, most of the flights of the day. We got called by the Marines, Army, whoever, to, to lay down suppressing fire from, the, from about 1,200 feet, 2,000 feet. And at night, we flew four or five missions every night, kicking out flares, illuminating the area around the perimeters. So um, that was my first tour. It was almost day and night, seven days a week, the whole year. Describe any contact you had with the enemy, realizing you were in the air, but you're taking fire also. Well, we're in the air taking fire. My first experience with what I thought was the enemy was getting my first haircut at Da Nang. Uh, it was a Vietnamese barber. Uh, I'm sitting in a chair, and he's cutting my hair. He pulls out a straight razor, tries to make a strap. Well, I had my hand on my gun at the time. <laughs> Thinking, this guy cut my throat, I wouldn't know the difference. I wouldn't know about it. Yeah. But I'll shoot him at least once before I die. <laughs> but I, would, I, I froze solid when that blade hit my, on my ears. Yeah. Give me a good haircut. After I left, I thought, that was silly being afraid of this guy. Never had any main contact with the enemy. Uh, not my first tour, my second tour I did. Face-to-face okay. -to -face contact. 
my job was boring as could be. It was hard. It was oppressive. It was day and night, rain and shine, loading, unloading, fixing the engines, tuning things up, sheet metal, burnt patching bullet holes, uh, replacing tires that got shot out, oil cans that got shut out, oil tanks. It was just a hard, hard labor. That's what it was. I learned a lot about airplanes. Did you get to know members of the the crew? Oh yeah, I got real close with them. Uh, my captain, the first officer, were usually lieutenants or mm -hmm. first lieutenants. Uh, we had several flight crews that operated. We had three ships at Denang at one time. Mm -hmm. and we were rotate sorties. Yeah. Sometimes all three people at one time. Mm -hmm. um, we got pretty close. I, I'm in contact with several of them still. Okay. Did you ever have much contact with the civilians, the, the local Vietnamese? I did. They had them on base there as uh, hired laborers. Uh, we had a, a hooch mama, or mama son took care of our hooch, which is a six-man barracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they cook our, I mean, wash our clothes, shut our shoes, make the bed, um, keep things really straightened up. And they always had guys running around the, the, the base that were uh, doing lawn maintenance. Um, and I heard stories about rice bugs. I never heard, never seen one until that night. They're huge, big black beetles. And I was walking down the, we were going to the PX one day and I saw a guy in the ditch with a sickle cutting the weeds and I saw him stop and pick up this huge beetle, broke it open like a corn, big as a corn cob, and sucked the insides of it out. I almost hurled right there. <laughs> But that was consuming rice bugs. They eat rice and they digest it in their system and they yeah. there's a delicacy to them. Yeah. Huh. They were weird people. Very strange people. <laughs> in what way? In addition to that? <laughs> well, their their culture is different. Uh, they waste nothing. I certainly I saw that. They they could take a chicken neck and feed a feed an army or some fish heads and boil it down into something called nut mom. Which was god awful smell. It was worse than anything in the world. In fact, I threatened my mama son once to knock that crap off because I've been flying all night. I try to sleep during the day. It's 110 degrees outside. It's hot as hell. You can't sleep over there. And this funky smell comes flooding in my, in my door through the screen wall. And I woke up gagging. I mean, it's horrible. I walked outside. There's four or five of us sitting around a little, what do you call those? Pots they use. Yeah. It was black stuff bubbling in there. I thought, what in the hell is this? And they just jabber, jabber, jabber. Their teeth were black as coal, shooting a beetle nut. And uh, Nip Mom, they poured on the rice and they passed it around. It was like a sauce or a seasoning. Yeah. And I said, You do that again here, I'm going to shoot you. Get, it, get away from here. Oh, you're number 10 GI. I said, No, I want to sleep. <laughs> and fresh air, not this stuff. That was pretty bad. I was pretty busy most of the time uh, on the flight line or trying to eat or trying to get some sleep yeah. or some rest somewhere. What were your living conditions like? Uh, marginal. We had tin roofs, uh, screen walls, sandbags three deep up about, um, I guess, chest high and about three foot screen and then a tin roof. Uh, we had plywood floors if we were lucky. No air conditioning. If you're lucky, you had a fan and a mosquito net. I remember my first week in Vietnam, I didn't have a mosquito net. And my God, I was eating alive, eating alive. I was living in a nice, comfortable area compared to some people, like Marines or Army in the bush. So I had a bed every night, or a day, whatever it might have been. But the mosquitoes were horrible over there. It took a while to get used to them. Yeah. And somehow, I guess after a period of time, I became immune to them. It didn't bother me anymore. Huh. I never could figure that out because I had not some insides of golf balls for the first two or three months. Jeez. And it's all got mosquito net. Yeah. Did you ever get attacked by an enemy force at the base? We did. We got shelled quite often. Uh, the thing was Rocket City, they call it nickname. Uh, we'd get mortared at night, and once we threw a little bit of rockets, would come flying in all the time. They couldn't shoot with a hoop, they were just random shots. Uh, every once in a while, they'd walk a mortar down the flight line. Mm -hmm. And my ship got hit once, uh, but I patched them up, yeah. had some damage in the wings. But a lot of times we'd go outside at night and have a beer and watch them shoot and huh. just watch the fireworks go on. Yeah. 
every now and then we said, yeah, I remember this very clear as a bell, that we were sitting on the, on the brevet was having a beer. And um, we had a, about 300 yards from the edge of the base out to the, to the jungle was clear. Defoley, it was it's just, I guess, minefield barbed wire. And every now and then you see a flash out there from the distance. You see tracers. They were bright green. And they come ricocheting across the flight line and just, and once in a while you see them spraying. I thought, I'd get down, we did, so we ducked it. <laughs> they came right over our head, and we could hear them whizzing by. Huh. Uh, it was just something to see. We were 20 years old, and we were, I went the first time in our lives having a big adventure. It was all somewhat fun, but very serious, too. Yeah. Were there occasional casualties as a result of these attacks? Yes. Every, uh, every once in a while, a mortar would hit somebody, I hit several guys, a uh, rocket would hit some building. Or, um, yeah, that was pretty bad. Yeah. Now, how long were you in Vietnam on your first tour? 12 months and 13 days. Okay. And when did you leave, approximately? I left there in uh, January 69. January 69. I came okay. home. Glad to leave, too. Yeah. And my first assignment was to. Uh, Stateside was uh, England Air Force Base in Florida. Let, let me ask you one question, more question about your tour. What was your unit? Fourth Special Operations Group. Okay. Okay, now, now continue. When you returned? They put me in a Special Ops Group in Florida. They had the 119 gunships there, the C-130 AC gun gunships there, and they were phasing out the C-47s. So they figured the guys that were already trained in that, in that lifestyle, they're going to keep them together. I kind of wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> but they did, and while I was there, I, uh, I wanted to fly still, still wanted to fly. And the next, next thing is, the next best thing to do was to become a flight crew member. So I applied and was accepted to the flight engineer school. And uh, that was uh, back to Chinook, uh, and to Kelly Air Force Base in Texas. And that was about eight months of intensive training, how to become a flight engineer on a, on a reciprocating engineer aircraft. And that led to my second assignment. Describe your training for that, how that was different than what you did the first time. Well, the first time was maintenance. Uh, you learn the, the guts of the airplane, how to, how to patch it up. You, you know what makes it work, how it works, when it's supposed to work, when it's supposed to not supposed to work. Being a flight crew member, I had a basic foundation understanding already was there. Yeah. I knew the airplane. So it came really easy, fairly easily. Uh, Except on the bigger aircraft, on C-119, I had my own panel. I had my own throttles, I had my own mixture controls, I had my, uh, my generators and my alternators, actually. I had to parallel those and transfer oil, transfer fuel, I had to do weight and balance for the aircraft. And, of course, that was all given to the captain. Mm -hmm. I was his handyman, so to speak. Okay. Now, when you got home from the first tour, you, I'm sure you... Were with your family some and with I your was. friends. I was. Describe so, that whole situation, what their questions were and what their attitude was and how you well, handle it. I was glad to be home. Uh, my, my son was born then oh. when I was home. And um, I was proud of Papa there. Yeah. And uh, we were living on base. Uh, I, I knew then that Florida, was, South Florida, was the panhandle was a rural, rural area. And uh, as you can attest to this, most military bases had a had an aura around there. The civilian populace didn't have much to do with you. Mm -hmm. We learned to accept that too. Yeah. As far as getting gas somewhere, using the gas station, or trying to cash a check off base, they gave you a real funny look. Mm -hmm. They didn't trust you. Yeah. And I can see where probably a lot of guys abused that trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a nice little assignment. It's quiet and peaceful. Now, what was your original commitment in terms of years? Four years. Four years. Okay. And so you had served about two years after you? Two and a half years, okay. yes. Okay. And my third year, I re-enlisted. Okay. I was talking about re-enlisted. So okay. uh, I liked what I was doing as a flight engineer. I okay. enjoyed being a crew member. I enjoyed having a flying suit on. Yeah. And a lot more prestige went along with the job other mm -hmm. than the knuckle-busted mechanic. Right, yeah. I thought. 
but I had pity for those guys. I knew what they were doing because I was one of them. Yeah, that's good. I treated them right. So you could relate to them and knew I what could. their problems were and issues were. I, I did. Yeah. Yeah, we had flock of members that were abusing them. I took their side. Good. I took the maintenance guy's side because I knew what he'd been through. Uh -huh. It's not. It's a very thankless job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but a very important job. Well, you'd think so. <laughs> when you think of an airplane, all you think is a pilot. Well, he doesn't get there by himself. Yeah, yeah. But they sometimes forget that. Were you pretty sure you were going to go back to Vietnam? No, I didn't. I wasn't sure at all. Okay. I wanted to get on the C-130s, mm -hmm. but they put me on um, 118s, which is a C-54, a four-engine commercial type plane. Mm -hmm. We were hauling, uh, it was like a base flight operation, okay. which the base commander had access to it. They would call, they would take people out, bring people back. It was kind of a, it was a plus job to have. Mm -hmm. We were fed nicely, we were treated nicely, we were, we were bivouacked nicely, we were billeted okay. nicely. Okay. It was in the middle of that wonderful tour that I didn't want to leave. I love Florida. Yeah. Uh, I got orders again. And I thought, son of a gun, here we go. My wife was pregnant, uh -huh. and I tried to use that to bail out. I said, sorry, they're going. So uh, back to Vietnam I went. Okay. And that was 1971. Okay. Tell us about that tour, your experiences, where you were, what you you were in. January 71, I flew back into Cameron Bay. Um, from there, we're another holding facility. And I was sent to a unit called the 18th Special Operations Group in the Training Air Force Base, the Training Air Base, which is on the coast of South Vietnam. Uh, we were a tenant unit there, meaning that we got seconds for everything. And we had no priority at all for anybody. We took care of ourselves, we scrounged, we steal, we borrow, we, whatever we could do. Uh, there were four ships there, four C-119s, and I was trained on those. Uh, I got to know the people pretty well. They were a little tighter operation than that of what I've been used to in the C-47s. That was pretty loosely run. This was more professional, more uh, more serious. And so I had to adapt to that. Um, we were called all over the country. We flew in and out of Quang Tri, we flew uh, Quang Yon, we were uh, even as far east as Pleiku. Uh, wherever we were needed, that's where they sent us. Okay. And it's usually a three or four day or sometimes a week at a time, we would go into a little place like Tay Ninh on the Cambodian border by the Paris Peak. Mm -hmm. We worked out of there for almost two weeks, uh, peppering the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We did night flights of the map and day, day missions too. Mostly night flight. We had a FLIR system on there, which we didn't have on C-47. The FLIR is a night vision camera that would pick up heat from any vehicle down there. It, it wasn't sensitive enough to pick up a body heat, but it picked up a truck exhaust or a tank. Mm -hmm. And we were used to looking for trucks or any motorized vehicle. So we had four Gatlin guns on there and had two 20 millimeter cannons for the Gatlin guns. And they would do a number on the machine. Mm -hmm. So we were basically truck killers. On Ho Chi Minh Trail, we worked that thing up and down the whole side from yeah. uh, from Quang Tri area and the Laotian border all the way down the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. And we did some ground support for some units here and there in different operations. Um, I forgot to tell you, we were involved in Operation Niagara out of Da Nang, which was um, the invasion of Quezon, the surrounding Quezon Air Base, Quezon Marine Base. And, um, we did some, sometimes four or five missions a night, hmm. uh, dropping flares and then laying down suppressing fire on uh, on the advancing NVA. Huh. And we did the same thing in, uh, in the 119s. I was involved in an operation called Lanson 719, which got popularity. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what it was at the time. I knew we were going to Laos. I thought this we shouldn't be over here. Mm -hmm. It was an NVA. I mean, it was a South Vietnamese Arvin operation going to lay off to, to break up the, the body of the NBA over there. And we flew support for them, air support. And one of our sister ships knocked out eight Russian tanks, which would be operated by the NBA. Yeah, talk about that some more. And for purposes of the record, talk about LAMSOM and what it was and, and well, a little bit more about knocking out those I tanks. Knew about it. I wasn't on the ground, so what I knew about that was that we were going into Laos, 
And uh, if you got if we went down, we'd leave all our identification at home. We were told to strip the things clean. Still flying a U.S. military airplane. <clears throat> but if we had to bail out or go down somewhere, we could be civilians with no identity on us. That kind of worried me. Yeah. I didn't like the idea of going down in the jungle, not knowing, with no idea of anything. I mean, how am I going to get home? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't tell us that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we flew at night, uh, and we we were in a perimeter of 2,000 feet, round and around and around and around, over the way. We'd drop flares, and we'd run out of fuel, we'd go back and refuel, re ammo, and come back and do it again. Um, that was basically it. We did a lot of firing over there, a lot of late night, heavy, heavy fire over there. And it was a three week operation, and we were, it was messed up. We took a hit there too, we got a picture of my airplane, and we took some triple A fire and blew the belly on the plane. Didn't hurt anything vital, but we had to put it down quick. So we came back and landed at a little place called Quang Tree. It's a little small base right there. Mm -hmm. We got it patched up to, to the point where it could fly and flew it back to uh, the Terang. And the airplane was eventually scrapped out. Yeah. And, uh, they used it as a, to rob parts off of it. Now you were on these flights, weren't you? I was on those yes. flights, yes. Okay. yes. Getting hit um, from ground fire is you hear it explode around you at night. You couldn't see it. I used a bright flash, like thunder. And boom! And every now and then you hear uh, some metal fragments pepper the ship. If you can imagine being in a trash can, someone throwing baseballs at it, it's about what it sounded like. Mm -hmm. Every now and then a small round would come through, like a 20 millimeter, a 51 cal would fly through the floorboard. Mm -hmm. And it'd wake you up. It would make you think. Mm -hmm. We had flak vests and we had chicken plates, which is a metal plate you'd wear. Most of us would take those things off and sit on them, protect your bottles. Yeah. Hit me anywhere but down there. Yeah. So yep. <laughs> uh, it was a standard operation. Yeah. These uh, Soviet vehicles that were destroyed, were those in Laos on the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Yes, they were. Okay. Yes. Okay. They were. Describe the traffic on the trail that you saw. Well, it was amazing to see the, the, on the floor screen. I could lean over back to the gunner was and, and just what are you looking at here? And you point out these little these little dots. These are all, it's a caravan going down the trail here. And we're gonna bring in some F-4s with napalm or whatever. They were coordinating back and forth with, with other, other flights. And we would fly right down the trail and just lay a hole, put down 40,000 rounds of 20 millimeter, and then make a quick pass and come back with our 7.62 Gatling guns and do it again. Mm -hmm. And you could, I could, I could watch it sometimes I got the throttle set just right. I went back and watched when our guns hit. That little small red speck got real big. You know, that was detonation. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> they got something there. So they had quite a few kills. What was the reaction of the crew when you looked down and oh, know that you like got to a baseball game, watching yeah. the home run being hit by your favorite team? Yeah. Hey, we got one. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, it was a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. And it was the entertainment we had to yeah. keep our minds off what we were doing. Yeah. And then we get back to the AAA, and uh, you see the bright flash here and there, and uh, just hope to God it doesn't hit you. Yeah, describe those AAAs. You don't want to know about it. You don't want to know about it. Uh, they were like, uh, I don't know what millimeter they were, 40 millimeter, and they were set to detonate at certain altitudes. And uh, it was fragmentation bombs, and they would explode, and yeah. if you're in the vicinity, you're going to get hit. You know? yeah. Yeah. Church up out of the air. Hmm. Uh, they weren't very nice. I, I try not to think about them. Yeah. What were the living conditions like on your second tour when you were at, uh, on the ground? A little better, but not much. A little better. I had more time off the second tour because I didn't fly every day. Mm -hmm. We had crew schedules. Mm -hmm. and that was not like that. Yeah. Uh, we had a uh, wooden building. Screen windows, and we had uh, one air conditioning in the whole building. It was better than having nothing at all. We augmented that with fans. Everyone had a fan in their little cubicle. Mm, excuse me. And uh, we had hot showers. We had a nice chow hall. We were close to the PX. Uh, we, it was a pretty nice life, uh, considering it was Vietnam. And we had a, a group there in the train that was an uh, army group on the same uh, base with us called the 92nd uh, Helicopter Assault Company. It was called, um, they had a logo on their plane, on their ships called uh, uh, Pussy Galore. Uh, 
don't know why, what the four. <laughs> James Bond types too, yeah. so I got to do a few of the, the, the war officers there quite well. We drink together in the clubs and stuff. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to see the gunship, so they were amazed with the, the, the firepower we had. Yeah. They wanted to put that on their helicopters. Yeah. And, uh, and I was amazed at what they did. They were down on the ground in and out of the jungle area. So like a fool, can I ride along with you guys? Sure. Got the M16 to come along. They were always willing to have an extra pair of eyes. Now, if they went right on us, no, we couldn't do that. Yeah. Air Force were real strict. You can't do that. The Army didn't give a damn. Come on. <laughs> so I had a day off every now and then. I'd get my camera, remove the camera, and I'd jump out there and go with them, get on there. And I flew with them about 25 or 30 missions. They were doing scud runs, carrying mail out, bringing things back out. And every now and then, kick, taking some uh, troops out, alert team. Yeah. My first introduction to alert team, I thought, my God, my God, I'm glad I'm not one of you fellas. I don't think I want to do that. I like being in the bed at night. I mean, these guys had camo on them. They were, they were serious. That's LRP, Long Range Patrol. Long Range Patrol, yeah. And they were, they were serious people. They didn't smile very much. Special Forces. Mm -hmm. um, try talking to them, they just sort of look at you real cold and grunt. Mm -hmm. I don't mess with them. <laughs> But uh, we'd take them out and drop them off, and then we'd go back to some, some fire base and sit and have coffee and wait for a call. Well, one call did come in one day, and, and uh, Don Nimlet was a captain that I was flying with. He said, you might want to hang here. It's going to get pretty hot out there. I said, well, what if you don't come back? He said, well, find your way back the best way you can. Well, I'm 300 miles from my base. I'm not going to find my way back, so I'm going with you. So I have my gun with me. I have a chicken plate on me. And I went out with them, and uh, this is when I had face to face contact with them. There was an APC burning in the middle of the dirt road down there. It had been ambushed. And I could hear sporadic fire around you. It's amazing with that blade popping like that. Grab fire is as loud as can be, very clear and distinctive. And there's a firefight going on. So they're, they're hovering around, and some major with a green gray was talking to the guys on the ground and back and forth. So we went down the road and sat down, and the pilot had a torque on the ship while the major got out and went up front. I'm sitting here, the gunners are cocked and ready, they're scanning the horizon. I'm looking out there too. I see this head pop out of the bushes. It was a Vietnamese. I safety went off and I was racing up and they got to pull my gun down. I started burning. The whole clip was gone just like that. He said, that's one of our guys. I said, how the hell do you know? It was a it was an Arvin. Oh. And I could have murdered the guy. Yeah. Because I didn't know what I was doing. I was afraid for my life. I saw a Vietnamese in the bush. He's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Well, he was supposed to be there too. He was watch our perimeter. And I'm glad the guys caught me. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd have yeah. never gotten over that. Yeah. But we got mortared there too. Uh, we took rockets at night. Well, how, back to this operation. How long were you on the ground? With the army guys? Mm -hmm. I was just there one day and out. Okay. That was one of my last missions I flew with them. Okay. Uh, we came back to another mission that had uh, 14 holes in the helicopter. Hmm. I said, fellas, that's enough. I have enough. God bless you. I'm back. I'll do this again. Yeah. I'll get paid for the shot like yeah. this. Yeah. But I drank with them and party with them and a uh, good bunch of people. Yeah. In fact, Captain Nedley lives in Texas right now. I, mean, he, I get a Christmas card from him every now and then. Yeah. He gets one from me. Um, we were kids then. I was, what, 23 and he was 25? Yeah. yeah. When you were stationed in the train, did you get into town much and have any contact with civilians there? Uh, every once in a while. The base wasn't off limits. Uh, we could go in there and we'd go party in some, in some places. Mm -hmm. and every once in a while we'd get, um, we'd get in some kind of trouble over there. Mm -hmm. Somebody'd drink too much or yeah. make the wrong comment to the wrong person. And we mostly on back. We were pretty straight laced. So we were governed pretty well. We were threatened if we got into trouble, it's gonna be your, it's gonna be your ass. So we yeah. kept ourselves pretty straight. And the Trang was a fairly nice town, wasn't it? it was Old French nice town on the town. coast. Mm -hmm. It's French built. Uh, uh, the people there were pretty nice too. Uh, we were told there certain areas were off limits, but you know how GIs are. Yeah. They're off limits in name only. So yeah. We check them out. Yeah. Never saw any trouble over there. Uh, we've heard some stories about guys getting their throats cut. Uh, being robbed by by prostitutes or whatever, but they would show us all these 
VD will be used to uh, <laughs> Uh, I didn't want to do anything <laughs> with any other ball. <laughs> it's just too dangerous. I mean, you never yeah. know who had what or what you're going to catch. Yeah. In fact, a buddy of mine and I were walking down the street to train one night, and some Vietnamese lady came out and said, Hey, GI, you come here and give something you never had before. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, you can't cure it either. <laughs> so we kept on going. It might have been our own business. What unit were you in while you were in the train? I was with the 18th SOG, SOG, okay. Special Operations Group. Okay. Now I realize you were in different locations, different positions, but did you see any discernible difference the second time you went and compared to the first time? Oh, I did, yes. It was much more militarized uh, second tour. Mm -hmm. uh, they were painting rocks around the, around the uh, first sergeant's office, around the flight, base flight area. Everything was becoming more like stateside. Yeah. Whereas in Da Nang, it was primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, Protocol wasn't that strictly enforced. Whereas it was in '71, it was got really strict. Yeah. And they had white sidewalls, uh, shine shoes, hmm. a lot of state side things that we didn't have before. Yeah. And the train was a really nice city compared to the name. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, it was like night and day. Mm -hmm. So my second tour was almost like being stateside. Did you see any differences in morale between your first and second tour? Just of the, the soldiers that you. Served with the airmen, the airmen that you served with. I saw a lot of morale drop on the second tour. The first tour, we were all like a family. We took care of each other. Second tour, it was uh, a lot of drugs were coming in into play. Uh, I was never exposed to it. We had a maintenance crew chief that was, or a maintenance guy that was uh, busted a few times. Mm -hmm. You could look at him, the long hair. By this time, the hippie movement was really in mm -hmm. full swing. And you could see some of the GIs that had been drafted or that had avoided the draft, were really getting involved in the Bob Dylan psychedelic stuff. Yeah. Uh, this different mentality. Yeah. So you think that was based more just on what was happening in, in our country? It was a social yeah. Um, influence, yeah, yeah, back home. Okay. It was hate Ashbury in Vietnam. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Trying to be anyway. Yeah. Now how long was your second tour? It was uh, 12 months. Okay. That was uh, one day short of one, one full year. And they were facing our unit down, giving it to the Vietnamese. We were involved in giving some of our ships to them. And uh, we had 12 ships. And right before I left there, we had three left in our unit. So they were phasing them out. Now, when you left, how did you feel about the future of the war and the outcome? I thought, there's no way we can lose this, but the politicians were really mucking things up. Yeah. First tour, we, we had pretty well, pretty far where we wanted to. Yeah. If got a ground call for it, he got it. Second tour, if the guys had a ground call for fire, we had to get clearance. Yeah. There's all kinds of steps you had to go through to get clearance to do that. And sometimes we were denied yeah. uh, a safe area, a friendly area. It was just too much interference, it seemed like. Yeah. You're, you're like trying to boxing a, a fight with one hand behind your back. Yeah. When did you leave to come back home after your second tour? I left in uh, January 72, okay. and uh, I was told when I left there to change clothes in Los Angeles and strip the cities. I thought, why? Well, I found out why. Yeah. I was in LA airport and uh, walking down through there with my uniform on, I had a duffel bag with me. So I was going to find a bathroom where I could change clothes. In the lobby of LAX airport, there was a bunch of guys in yellow robes, orange robes, chanting around mm -hmm. Harry Christmas. And I try to go around them and bypass them, but sure as hell, it comes one guy, some freaky looking dude, trying to hand me a flower. I just mind my own business, kept on walking, ignored him. I wasn't rude, but I just didn't want to stop and be friendly with him either. Well, the rest of them came over with him. And uh, one of them said something derogatory to me. He said, how do you feel about killing people? I thought, I just looked at it real cold and I said, piss off. Then I felt somebody grab me on the shoulder and they put their hand on me. Instinct, I came back with an elbow and hit the guy around the throat. Down he went, gagging and choking, and I thought he was going to die. Police showed up. I was arrested. I was taken to the back of the security area with the police department. 
I don't know what happened then with Harry Krishna. I don't know if he died or not. I'm sure he didn't die. I just yeah. gave him that example. He shouldn't have grabbed me. Uh, but the police kept me there for about four hours. I said, they may prosecute you, they may not. I thought, well, thank you very much. Welcome to the States. Uh, I missed my flight, my connected flight back to Georgia. So I spent the night there. I stayed in the police department there all night. I wasn't arrested, I wasn't fingerprinted or anything, but I was there detained. And the next morning they said, go on home. Yeah. Change clothes and go on home. I thought, that's a hell of a welcome home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the attitude had changed a lot by then. Uh, people had really become against the war. And <clears throat> I can see that. I can understand being against the war, but why be against the people that you sit over there to fight for you? Yeah. That I couldn't digest. Well, that's that's a sad story for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And working in the USO with you guys, I tell you, it does more good to see how well they're treated now. Is yeah. How they're applauded and how they're thanked. What they're doing. That's so true. Yeah. That makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Now, what kind of reception did you get when you got home? Well, my family threw me a little party. I had, a, I had all the family people there, cousins, aunts, and uncles, and they all wanted to see me. Uh, they had to see my daughter, who's been born while I was gone. So I wanted to see her too, and uh, we had a nice little gathering. We had a, a down-home country homecoming with homemade ice cream, watermelon, uh, fried chicken. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was, yeah. Yeah. it was good to be back home. Did you stay in the military then? Or? Did not. Did yeah. not. I served that, that finished that tour out in 75, uh, and I decided I wasn't going to re-enlist anymore. And uh, I had my pilot's <laughs> license, like I said before. I wanted to get a job flying somewhere, doing something with airplanes. Yeah. I thought I'd go back to college, but I didn't. I knew I didn't want to invest the time. I had a family and two kids to feed. I had to work somewhere. And um, my first job out of the military was with a company called Zantop International Airlines in Detroit, Michigan. So I would pack up the family and we'd go to live in Detroit. And that was a horrible, horrible, horrible place to live. <laughs> we were flying. Uh, Lockheed Electra's, four-engine freighters. Uh, I got a short stint in Alaska with a pipeline, working up there. Paid a lot of money, but the living conditions were worse than Vietnam. Yeah. You slept in a tent, you didn't have heat at the time, it was cold and mosquitoes and bugs, but you got paid well. Yeah. So the money went home, and that's what it was all about, is feeding your family. Yeah. Yeah. Have I said too much already? Uh, no. you. You've got a fascinating story. In fact, I, I don't think so. I, I want to. You guys on the ground have the stories to tell. Well, but without guys like you, it would have been pretty tough for the guys on the ground. So you, you played a big role in this. So don't don't minimize what you did, and you put your life in danger every time you went up in one of those aircraft. Um, do you stay in touch? You, you mentioned a little bit uh, that you stay in touch with some of the. Uh, other people you served with. Do you have reunions? Or yeah, the 18th SOC has a reunion every so often. They have different parts of the country. I went to one in Texas uh, in 1997, the last one I went to. Mm -hmm. It's kind of expensive doing those things like that. Yeah. And you see guys, that you, it's mostly all flight crew members, the captains, the navigators, the right. pilots. And the maintenance guys, we would always go off to our own little side, or the engineers like us were enlisted guys, yeah. have our own little reunion. Yeah. And I've got about a dozen guys I keep in touch with. Yeah. I hear from them now and then. I get a phone call. Hey, asshole, what are you doing? You know, I knew exactly what it is. <laughs> How did your military service, and particularly your two tours in Vietnam, affect you in your life? And what did you learn from, those, from that experience? Well, discipline. I want to say character. Family comes first. Uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think if I had not gone to the military, I wouldn't have a better sense of what those things are now. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Good. Uh, wouldn't want to do it again, but I wouldn't trade for anything right. in the world. Right. Right. I was in college, I'd do it again. <laughs> I was yeah. In school. Yeah. 
life didn't work that way. Sometimes it throws you curves, you just gotta go with it. And I'm sure your father eventually was very proud of what you did. My father died in 68. 68, okay. Yeah, he was uh, worked the first time over there, and uh, in fact, uh, he died while I was in Vietnam. Really? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Tony, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? No. Before we finish, I, I want to give you a chance to say anything else you'd like to say about your experiences in the service in Vietnam, life in general, or any message you would like to give as part of this interview. Well, I don't know what I can impart other than uh, it was a good career to have. Uh, it, it taught me a, a valuable lesson that took me to where I am right now. Well, I left the airlines, I uh, went to work with the FAA as an examiner and an inspector. And I retired from there in 04, which was my military background really added to that. Without it, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have a job to start with. Because yeah. they were hiring most of the Vietnam vets, uh, Air Force and Navy type. And the guys that we were replacing were ex-World War II pilots. Mm -hmm. um, by that time, I used my GI Bill to get my my, all my ratings, including my ATB, which is the airline transport rating, and heavy jets and everything else. So it, it really worked out well for me. Uh, my family's doing well. My kids are raised and happy and healthy. And uh, right. I have grandkids now. Right. Life is good. Good. Life is good. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in, and particularly appreciate you serving your country. I mean, you did two tours. You did them voluntarily. Nobody was forced you to do it. You, you served your country because you wanted to serve your country and um, we that means a lot to all of us and we really appreciate it and again really really appreciate you coming in and sharing your story. My pleasure. Thank you.